Hey everybody, I'm Kimberly Gill. While you're watching Wheel of Fortune, you might want to grab your phone, your tablet, your laptop, whatever you have. Log on right now to click on Detroit.com. Our Education for All Town Hall is starting. My colleagues Devin Skillian and Paula Tutman are live right now. As we rearranged our lives to accommodate an uninvited virus, few aspects of life were untouched. From visiting the grandparents to trying to find toilet paper, everything was in upheaval. And so it was for our entire education system. Clearly, coronavirus was too cruel for school. With no lead time, no warning, teachers, parents, and students were left scrambling. Three months of improvisation that put a whole new twist on the concept of substitute teaching. Shelved sports seasons, canceled proms, and strange virtual graduations got a lot of the attention, but it was more than that. What was the impact on learning? What was happening to our kids' psyches and their social development? We turn the corner to a new school year, and those very questions linger more urgently than ever. Frustrations erupt over a lack of answers and over divisions about the best way forward. Tonight, the answers we can find as of August 13, 2020. We'll go to health class. What's the latest medical advice? We're in home ec. What are working parents to do? We'll be in the computer lab. What can we do about the digital divide? We'll attend study hall. In class or out, how do we make sure our kids are learning? And we've got calculus. How in the world will we equitably fund our schools in a school shuffling pandemic? Not all schools are ready to open, but ours is. It's our live town hall on Click on Detroit. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our Education for All Town Hall. I'm Devin Skillian. And I'm Paula Tutman. We have a Zoom screen full of major decision makers when it comes to how your children will return to learn this fall. Now, this is a crucial week for school districts. The calendar says they have until Saturday, August 15th, to turn in their back to school plans. But they really only have until Friday. No matter how you cut it, this is the 11th hour for districts. And as we have every day for months, let's first consider the numbers. As of today, the state of Michigan has had 90,900 or 392 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 6,289 Michiganders have died from the virus. As the disease continues its spread, parents and students still trying to get answers to these basic questions of how education is going to work this year. Yeah, indeed, for sure. And if you go to Rochester Community Schools, your first day starts 20 days from now. Detroit Public, uh, Detroit Public Schools Community District, easy for me to yeah, say, yeah, right? right. <laughs> and your start date is in 25 days. Whether you are in Ann Arbor or Southfield and you start the year completely remotely or like Novi in Detroit, you have in-person options. We know you still have questions. So instead of just uh, hoping you can knit together the information yourself, we're going to give you access to the decision makers tonight. Absolutely. We've been collecting your questions and we're going, we're going to take them directly to the source. So you can see we are really testing the inputs of uh, <laughs> how, many, how many you can get on one Zoom screen. Let's see how this goes. First, let me mention the superintendents that we have joining us tonight. Nikolai Viti, uh, the superintendent of the DPSCD school system. Uh, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson is the superintendent of Oakland Schools. She's with us. Dr. Uh, Randy uh, Liepa, uh, Wayne Risa Schools superintendent. And Michael DeVault, the Macomb uh, Intermediate School District superintendent. Uh, we also have with us tonight, uh, and I'll, we'll be going to them throughout the evening back and forth. So uh, because as the questions come in to us, we want to uh, make sure that we're going to the, the, the source that's best suited to answer it. Representative uh, Pam Hornberger is with us. She is the chair of the Education Committee in the House. We just uh, reported earlier this yeah. evening the Senate is going back into special session coming up on Saturday with whether or not we should be forcing in school learning. Also, Terrence Martin, Detroit Federation of Teachers, and of course... Our Dr. Frank May George is, is here as well. So all here to answer your questions. Uh, let me start, if we could, with uh, Dr. Nikolai Viti. Uh, give me a, a little bit of a thought about where we stand right now, uh, Dr. Viti, from your, from your perspective, as you watch uh, the entire system trying to cobble together right now their own answers. Is that going to work? Can everybody move at the speed at which they want to, or would we be better off all moving together? <laughs> Um, uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. And um, I look forward to the conversation with a great panel. Um, you know, none of this is easy. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years as a teacher, 
principal superintendent, I've never faced something as challenging as this as a, as a person and as a professional. None of this is ideal. Um, we have so many contradictory uh, guidance from the federal level at the state level. Uh, there's great anxiety and fear um, among our employees, our families. Um, but, you know, I can only speak for DPSCD. We're doing everything we can uh, to create a plan that empowers parents uh, to make the decision that they think is best for their children as far as face-to-face -face or online. Obviously, if the governor uh, at any point feels like the uh, COVID numbers are too high to open up schools, then we would abide by that. Uh, and that goes for the state or local health department. If uh, either entity, uh, which is the empowered uh, medical experts in this situation say that it is uh, too dangerous to open up schools, then, then we'll abide by that. But I think it's important for DPSCD to be nimble and flexible with its plan so that we can move uh, accordingly based on the guidance uh, and requirements put forth by the federal and the state government. Yeah, that's a lot. Devin, you had a lot of good questions in there, but I'd also like to go to Dr. Wanda Cook-Robinson, who's the superintendent of, for all intent and purposes, Oakland County Schools. Mm -hmm. It's Oakland Schools. Dr. Cook-Robinson, I'm, I'm curious to know your thought process in all of this, because we are that close. You know, this is a shifting landscape. In fact, a week ago, I could have told you that the majority of schools in Oakland County would be starting face-to-face -face instruction. However, a week later, the majority are doing the virtual um, instruction to students. What we're finding is that one size does not fit all. The communities have different levels of risk in the environment, and each community in Oakland has surveyed their community. They have talked with their teaching staff, and it's those components that have helped them to make the decision of how they needed to start school. Uh, let me bring uh, Dr. Uh, Randy Liepa in here from uh, Wayne Risa Schools. Uh, Randy, it, 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 I, I'm curious as to when you are all as superintendents talking with each other, and I know a lot of these conversations have been going on, or do you find yourselves all in general agreement, or are there some sharp divisions here that y you think might be tearing apart a, a, a uniform approach? Yeah, actually, the, the agreement is on the most important things, which is we hear from superintendents and everybody in the education field, they want kids back in school. That is first and foremost what they know will provide the best education for students. And it actually, uh, that, that's universal. Where there's a difference, and it's a bit of what uh, Dr. Cook Robinson said, where there's a difference when it comes to their ability to implement the safety guidelines that were identified in the roadmap at the state level. And so I think the real struggle for school districts has been, they wanna get kids back at school in every way that they possibly can, but they just can't implement the safety recommendations that were outlined through the roadmap, and that's where they're struggling. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with these superintendents, including uh, Michael DeVault, and he's with the Macomb Intermediate School District, and so we'd like for you to weigh in while we're talking to our, uh, our superintendents for this part of the round table. Well, thanks very much for having us here. It's 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 real. It's a real delight to be here. Uh, I have similar comments. Uh, you, I'll answer it this this way. We have unanimity here in terms of the in in the county, the superintendents and school districts have been working together for months and weeks and trying to find solutions. We've we've explored all the options and tried to include everybody in that discussion. Uh, we've got great cooperation from our county executive, Mark Hackle. We purchased all the PPE stuff we need for all 140,000 students. They're in the school district now, ready to be used. We've had great cooperation from uh, Dr. Lokar, our county health uh, uh, doc. So I would have to say it, it, it's the same kind of situation, trying to face this, trying to find the right balance uh, in balancing face-to-face, uh, -face, hybrid, and also a, a remote option. So we're all working through that, trying to make the best best decision on behalf of both our safety of our employees, but, but more importantly, how we can best uh, uh, give uh, opportunity to all the students to achieve 
uh, whatever they can in uh, this awful situation. You know, we in the newsroom keep talking how every day it's like trying to take a sip out of a fire hose. Uh, the right. information, of the, uh, every day there's a new study. Yeah. Every day there's a new recommendation. New information. Uh, Nikolai, I, I'm curious as to whether you find your opinion of what you should be doing changing day by day, week by week, or has it stayed fairly consistent for the last month or so? Uh, it's been consistent. Um, you know, I think, I think the... We're still awaiting clarity from the state uh, regarding funding, uh, a possible requirement for face-to-face, -face, uh, looking at how attendance will be taken, uh, FTE. Um, so those are, I, I think, probably some of the most significant questions. But I think the, the data that we're looking at more than anything else is the infection rate uh, in the city. So after seven, about a seven-day average, going into at least Saturday, we were at a 2.7 uh, infection rate in the city. And most um, uh, experts are saying anything between five and 10 is too high. In fact, the uh, American Federation of Teachers at the national level has said schools should not open if it's beyond 5%. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the number we're looking at most closely. You know, if, if I were in Miami right now um, or many large urban school districts in Florida, I'd be the first one calling for the closure of schools. Uh, that rate is too high. Uh, but at some level, uh, we have to be consistent if we're gonna use science. Most science is saying, if you wanna call it in those gen generic terms, is that you shouldn't fully open schools and you shouldn't fully close schools right now. Um, but I would say directly the infection rate number is what we're keeping our, our greatest uh, eye on right now. Wanda, uh, how about you? Uh, do you find yourself hopping from idea to idea? Is, is the data a little overwhelming, or have you found a rather consistent sort of way to look at this? Wanda, I'm sorry. It was, it was for Wanda. If you, uh, I, I, we got Dr. Cook Robinson? Yeah. Did we lose her? Oh, we lost her. I'm sorry. Then, uh, Randy, let me let you go in on that question. Is the data uh, that, you're, that you're, we're being deluged with every day problematic for you, or is it helping you make your decisions? Uh, it's problematic in regards to there's so much out there that people want to hang on to their own set of data that they think is uh, uh, is impactful. Uh, but you know, from a from a big picture standpoint, the issue still is, you know, because in, in Wayne County we're a little bit higher uh, with the percentage that Dr. Vitti said we're you know right around that five percent, mm. and so when you get close to that. Again, the challenge for our school districts uh, that I've talked to is, can we implement the recommendations from the roadmap to really make few people feel like, you know, we've got the right things in place to have school. So if we're near five or a little bit below five, you know, that number is going to fluctuate. It's hard to open and close school based on those factors. And so they're really focused on, you know, are we going to have a safe environment as yeah. we you know, monitor that going? And that's that's been the big struggle that I've seen with some school districts. Everybody's different. When you look at a campus in Plymouth Canton with 6,000 students and three high schools right next to each other, and you go to another school district where maybe their high school has 450 students, they're two completely different uh, issues. And so that's why you're seeing a little bit of variance from school districts, but it really is that issue. Can they implement those safety requirements that are outlined in the roadmap? Yeah. Yeah, Mike DeVoe, you know, very difficult right now to be a superintendent. So what are your thoughts on that? Just the back and forth, hey. the different information and how no, no, you... No, 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 no. My job's easy compared to what parents have to do. Oh. Very easy. Yeah. Uh, just just set, me set the table, right? We had, we had a meeting last night where some teachers get, gave a presentation and talked about all the difficulties in, in having to go back in the classroom and their concerns. On the other side of the room, I had a, a, a several special needs parents mm. who were begging and, 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 and talking about the need to have their students serviced. Sure. So my job's easy compared to the, to, the, to the burden that they have or a single parent mom trying to get uh, education for, for a, a kid with remote learning or, or any kind of learning disabilities or yeah. ELL. So no, this job is easy here compared to what the parents are facing in the metropolitan area. That's a great point, but we also can't leave out the teachers. And as Devin introduced earlier, right. we've got uh, reps from our unions. Uh, Terrence Martin of the Detroit Federation of Teachers represents more than 2,000 teachers. And but I'd like to start with you because you also heard what Dr. Viti just said. Uh, of course, you've been negotiating a new contract that is 
ostensibly supposed to include a COVID clause. How are those talks going right now? What well, should parents know today? Well, first, thank you uh, for uh, having me uh, a part of this conversation, a very important one. Uh, we are in talks uh, uh, not only uh, about COVID return, uh, but also about um, um, you know, renewing our, our contract for our wages, working conditions, and benefits uh, for the next uh, upcoming year. Uh, and while uh, the talks are going slow, um, uh, we have been making some progress uh, uh, in many areas. Uh, one of the areas that uh, obviously remains a challenge uh, is is how do we return and how do we return safely? Yeah. How do we ensure uh, teachers and, and other staff members uh, that there's a reasonable assurance uh, that, that um, um, the recommendations uh, that have been made by the CDC and other entities uh, are going to be upheld by the school district? How do we ensure uh, that we make sure that there's proper PPE uh, and there's cleaning products provided uh, to teachers? And there's a reasonable expectation that social distancing is, is a possibility in many of our classrooms. Yeah. Uh, how do we make sure that there's proper ventilation in our buildings? Well, we know uh, that uh, the conditions of Detroit Public Schools community district buildings have made national news in the past mm -hmm. uh, with very poor ventilation and other issues uh, relative to the physical plant. Uh, we know that there have been some improvements that have been made, but still we're nowhere near uh, where our, our children and our community deserve to be relative to the conditions of our buildings. Uh, and so with with all that, uh, uh, it remains uh, with uh, many of our staff members and our, our employees, you know, that there's a, literally a fear uh, of returning to face to face instruction yeah. in the fall. We're hearing that. Yeah. And yeah. I know Paula Herbart, who really represents the majority of the teachers in the entire state, more than 120,000 teachers. What are teachers telling you about these various back to school plans and how they'll affect actual learning and also student retention? Thanks, Paula, for the question. I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, it varies from area to area, but the most important thing that we're hearing from our members is being a part of the development of the plans that each school system is putting forth. We represent over 1,100 locals in 550 school districts across the state and all 83 counties of Michigan. And so what might be true in Ontonagon may not be true in um, Southfield, what may be true in Benton Harbor may not be true in the Saginaw sure. area or in Reese in the Thumb. So we really believe in our lowercase d democratic process. We've empowered our local leaders to make sure that they're a part of the process. You know, under PARA, working conditions, health and safety are required subjects of bargaining. And so they have to be engaged in these conversations, not only to secure the safety and health of our members, with the students and the communities which they serve. And that's what they're really worried about, is if their voice isn't at the table, then those issues aren't being thought of in a more global sense in the community and valuing the fact that teachers and educator, education support professionals, we represent that group as well, whether you're an educator in the kitchen or in, on the buses or paraeducator or custodial maintenance, that you have families too. And that if you're going to work every day, um, or every other day, if it's a blended learning plan, that you're going home to families yourself. So that's why it's critical that our members are a part of the decision-making promise, uh, part of the decision-making um, scenarios, and that they are problem solvers in this work to ensure that students get the best education that they can, understanding the circumstances that are real in their communities. So Paula, just a quick follow up on that. And I'd also like Terrence to weigh in as well. And that is whether or not uh, you feel like you really have been at that table in these discussions enough so that your teachers feel safe enough returning, you know, returning back to school. Well, I can tell you that the strongest plans that we have right now and those that have already been turned in are ones that by and large have been worked on with the staff and our members across the state. Okay. Where they're having problems, where they're not allowing educators to be a part of the decision-making process, that's where the holdup is. You know, we've had a couple of districts um, that have said, here is the plan, what do you think? That's not bargaining. Um, and so in those instances where we're not being allowed a voice at the table, we're doing the things that we're legally allowed to do to ensure that our voice is part of the process. And, and Terrence, what would you say? Well, we haven't been part of the process. Um, uh, to Paula's point, uh, there was a plan uh, developed by the district. Uh, it was issued. Point. 
Yeah. Paula two Horvath. Paulus, yeah, two Paulus yeah. Horvath. <laughs> It, it, it was um, uh, issued uh, and, and put out to the general public uh, without the union's input, without teacher's input. Uh, and we found that very disturbing uh, uh, for our membership. Uh, and look, you know, we have folks uh, who are certainly ready to teach, want to go back to school and teach, uh, but don't feel that it's safe to do so face to face. Uh, and so we certainly uh, encourage the school district to continue the talks that we've had just recently. Uh, and really, we've been been talking more uh, recently about what that looks like in terms of returning to school. Uh, but initially, those plans certainly were not um, uh, including uh, uh, teachers in the conversation. Well, quite serendipitously in our Brady Bunch graphic that we've got going right there, Terrence, right above you is the superintendent of Detroit schools. Uh, Nikolai, talk a little bit about the concerns that you've just heard there, both uh, him feeling like they've been left out a lot of the conversation, but also his earlier point about worried about the, the health uh, factor of facilities, air circulation, that sort of thing. Dr. Vidi, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So there's been, um, there's been plenty of plans that have been issued from the CDC, the AFT, Governor's Return to Learn Task Force, uh, that outlines the safety um, strategies that have to be implemented uh, if there is face-to-face. -face. And again, uh, if the governor, state, local health department uh, states that it's unsafe to do face-to-face, -face, then we won't. But what we can say as a district is that, uh, unlike other school districts, uh, we do have the resources to implement the COVID safety strategies. We received $85 million as DPSCD to implement uh, the COVID-related strategies of temperature check machines, um, more nurses for each building, um, a symptoms check process, deeper cleaning of, of um, uh, buses and classrooms, um, PPE for all students. So you can't read our plan and it not mirror all the best, uh, the, the, all the safety uh, requirements for COVID. So um, in relation to engagement, um, when we uh, released our draft plan, we had 1,200 people participate in virtual meetings about that plan, where feedback could be given regarding what worked, what didn't, what needs to change. And there were quite a few changes made um, before that final draft plan was given to the board for approval. After the board approved that plan, uh, over nine community meetings over these last two weeks, we've engaged 20,000 internal and external stakeholders. I'll repeat that. 20,000. Yeah. So does it mean that everyone agrees with the plan? No. Um, but it's really hard to take a plan as complex as this one where you have multiple people wanting different things. Oh, you absolutely. want parents that, you know, right now we've engaged almost 70% of our parents and 20 to 30% want face-to-face -face instruction. Are we really going to ignore the voice of 15, 20,000 parents? about face-to-face -face if the state says it's it's safe. Hey, Dr. Vitti, um, can, so, I, go, so can I jump in there? Dr. Vitti, yeah, let me just jump in there just so, for a quick so, minute. Paul, real quick, there there is there is been engagement. The question is, how do you how do you move forward with trying to keep everyone's interests in mind? And it's nearly impossible to do that. Sometimes you just have to make hard decisions based on what you think is in the best interest of students and continue to communicate and problem solve just like Paula said, are we problem solving and are we owning the process and, and the implementation of it? Or are we just simply saying we don't want to do it? So we want to move on quickly, but I do want to also address the fact that the question on the table is that uh, the person right below you in the Brady, bo uh, Brady Bunch box <laughs> is Terrence Martin, uh, president of DFT. And his thought is that teachers have not been involved. So you, you talk about the 1,200 people, you talk about the 20,000 stakeholders, but I wanted you to address, and I think that's what Devin's question was, to address what Terrence Martin was saying, that he feels that teachers uh, in your district have not been at the table enough to have enough input so that they feel safe going back into the classroom. I can, I can guarantee you that when I say 1,200 people participated in the draft plan, Many of those were teachers. It also included every single union leader. When we, when we engage the community about the final plan of the 20,000, I guarantee you that teachers were part of that plan. We will be consistent with the collect, collective bargaining process. If anything has to be collectively bargained, it will be collectively bargained. But in the end, 
it is difficult to create a reopening plan with every single entity agreeing on that plan. But we are committed to negotiating everything that needs to be uh, collectively bargained. We have been doing that and we'll continue to do that. And I believe whether we're talking about DFT, teachers in general, we're going to arrive September 8th in a place that meets students and parents where they need to be. DFT has done that cons consistently. Teachers have done it and we're going to get it done by September 8th. I'd like to move to another topic, and I'm going to admit to you, I was hoping that what happened to us earlier would happen, that somebody would drop out of the call, because I want us to talk a little bit about our digital and connection issues and the digital divide and how we keep people from who are already maybe uh, at the margins from falling further behind. And uh, Wanda Cook Robinson, you dropped off the call, and you're back with us now. Uh, and I'm also going to want to let Rep uh, Representative Hornberger weigh in on this issue. But are we doing enough? After we had three three months of, of trying to figure out uh, people learning from home, um, we got a lot of folks uh, in both rural and uh, urban, urban areas, their only internet connection may be coming in over their phone. Are we doing enough to prepare for this new landscape where we have to have uh, virtual learning for who knows how long? Yeah, Dr. Cook Robinson. Yep, yep. Oh, I, I wasn't sure. Um, yes, in fact, you know, we are continuing to work on this issue. We were, we were supported by the Skillman Foundation and also United Way in helping us to provide connectivities in those difficult areas in Oakland County. We still have those needs. Uh, am I still with you? You I'm are. Yes, a lot indeed. Of trouble. No, you're you're okay. in. Yes, indeed. At home in. tonight. <laughs> Everybody in my neighborhood must be using it. <laughs> uh, but um, we, as I said, we involved the Skillman Foundation and United Way in helping us to provide that connectivity, and we are still working on it because we still have areas in Oakland County, particularly in Hazel Park and Oak Park, where there's not connectivity in the home. And that is a problem. Yep. And we're working on that. We're trying to find stations around the community where parents can go and get connected. Um, the first problem we had was devices. But we think we have just about solved that, again, with the help of the philanthropic community. But the con connectivity is still a bit of an issue for us. Well, certainly, De uh, Detroit had a great advantage this year in that they had that wonderful partnership, that $23 right. million. Dollars. But, uh, Dr. Cook Robinson, I also wanted to stay with you because, for instance, I was talking to the superintendent of the Southfield School District, which is Dr. Green, as you know, and she was saying in Southfield, which is, you know, you would think, well, Southfield, but they have a very, very high free and reduced lunch rate, as yeah. well as she's saying that as many as 40% of her students, for instance, don't have devices of their own. So it's one thing to have connectivity in a house. It's another thing when you have mm -hmm. kids in school, mm -hmm. in class, and they don't have devices of their own. And so how close are you to bridging that for communities like Southfield, Oak Park, I mean, any of your Oakland County communities? Yeah, we are, we are still working on that issue. I think we have done a good job in reducing the percentage, but we have not exonerated it. We do not have every child with their own device. And you are absolutely right. It's really difficult in a virtual environment to have a household of three children and each of them having to share. Yep. So we are working on that. We are still working to get grants. United Way is still working with us on finding possible funders to help us to purchase those devices. But we have made great strides in that area and that we have fewer and fewer. And working closely with Dr. Green in Southfield, Jamie Hitchcock in Oak Park, and Dr. Kufi in Hazel Park. Critical. Let me uh, bring in now Representative Pam Hornberger, who is the chair of the House Education Committee. I want you to weigh in on the digital issue uh, in a moment. But uh, Representative, if we could, let's start with I just I'm curious about what you're hearing. Are you hearing mostly from teachers, from parents, from superintendents? Where is the lion's share of uh, what well, I don't know if you want I don't want to call it complaining, but concern coming from in Lansing? Um, well, early on, I started, um, early on when this all started, I started Zooming with uh, ISDs around the state and talking to superintendents. So I, I've heard from a lot of superintendents. I'm hearing from, as a former teacher and a former school board member, I'm hearing from a lot of teachers that I know and then a lot of teachers just in my area and throughout the state that are reaching out. 
and um, parents. Yeah, definitely. Um, my daughter just graduated from high school, so she, you know, was the she got to be the recipient of you know no in-person graduation, which you know we rolled with. But so I'm hearing it across the board, and it, it's um, there are a lot of different issues that I know all of us are dealing with. So and and connectivity being one of them, I think early on talking to superintendents, you know, not only was that an issue for students. But even if they were able to get the devices into student hands, it was, you know, is there someone at home to support them if, if they're not able to get online on their own? You know, what is there an issue with, you know, three students and a parent trying to work from home with connectivity and broadband? So, you know, another issue that's going to come into play. But interestingly enough, I had superintendents reaching out and saying, you know, we have teachers that are telling us that they don't have connectivity at home, that they don't have Internet or they don't have devices. So, you know, one of the things early on that we started when we started um, talking with the governor's office was, um, you know, in in order to um, not have that issue, if if districts were going virtual, it was a request to have teachers, you know, report to their buildings and, and teach virtually from their classrooms because that would solve a huge problem for school districts as far as connectivity and teachers having the devices that they need to teach. And then as far as, you know, if there's a tech issue, there are tech people right there. If a computer dies that a teacher is working with, you know, students, they can quickly move to another area and then just you know, our teachers are going to need to quickly become experts in online teaching. And as a former teacher, that's a difficult thing to learn. Oh, there's they no did doubt. their best in the spring. But, you know, it, you know, if they are in the building and in the classroom teaching virtually, then they all, there's also time to do, you know, cohort um, meetings between if third grade teachers need to meet or science teachers need to meet. And there's also, you know, that, that um, professional development piece that can come in that can help them, you know, hopefully um, become better online teachers because it's not going to be an easy task. It's a different skill set. But uh, Pam, I also, though, want, and I don't want to call out any names here. I don't know if any of our superintendents want to voice this uh, to you themselves. But in our conversations, and I'm not at liberty to use names because these were background conversations with a newsroom with a number of superintendents across southeast Michigan, there was ardent frustration for, from them that they have not gotten better direction from Lansing on a plan uh, and that there needed to be more state coordination. Uh, I don't know if any, uh, if a superintendent, I, at this point, I, I probably have to ask you to raise your hand so I can see, so we're not talking over each other. If anybody wants to voice uh, some of their frustration with what they've got, whether it's coming out of the Capitol or the governor, uh, or, the, or the governor's mansion, but I, 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 there is this palpable sense of frustration that there hasn't been uh, more of a, co- uh, of a coordinated plan, focus, as we move now so close yeah. to the t- start of the school year. Oh, I'll agree with you. It's frustrating for me to have to negotiate through this process. This is something that should have been done weeks ago. We knew what we were facing. All of us know when school starts and what goes into the beginning of the school year. I, I, I mean, I, I did it for 23 years and I did it as yeah. a school board member for six years. This, so this can, isn't something that blindsided us. This should have been put in place a long time ago. So and if I can ask, why hasn't it? I've, if, I, if I can ask, let me jump in there. So why, why hasn't anything been done? Because we are... We're at the 11th hour for school. Well, uh, these superintendents are putting together budgets and they don't have um, guidance on what those budgets are going to look like. They don't know how much of a budget cut there's going to be. They're all buying PPE. We know what time and what days school starts. So I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, you, you, everybody knows, you, you, you know, you're an educator. Uh, right. Aaron Miller is an educator. You knew Correct. school was coming. And so what's taking so long? Well, you got to negotiate with the governor's office if you want to get anything done. Is this really, but is this just the governor? I mean, you all have to negotiate together and the plan still has to be in place. You still have so to there have were money. Two plans that There were two plans that were put out, the one that our caucus put out and then the one that came out from the governor's office. And when you sat and side by side read through them, they agreed about 85, 90% of the things in there were, we were in agreement. Okay. And cool. now it's, it's coming down to the basic you know, it, it's not the day-to-day issues that we're, we're, we're that we're negotiating. It's the um, count days that you know. The are we going to do 180 and 198 hours, or 1,098 hours? You know, are, are we going to? How are we going to do count days? Is it going to be a hold harmless for next, last year's count, or is there going to be a blend? And and quite honestly, that's what that is. What the issues are. That's <coughs> 
most time. Well, as long as I have you on the line, uh, just a, a very quickly, and I, a different house, but you're all under the same roof. And that is we've mm -hmm. been talking about the Senate meeting this Saturday uh, to talk about whether or not they're going to mandate schools have in-person learning. The majority of schools are going remotely. Uh, you've got to be a right. fly on the wall. What are you hearing about that? I, I don't think you're going to have to worry about mandates. Okay, so they're, they're, how about if I leave it at that? Yep, okay, so they're great. meeting Saturday, and you're saying don't worry about it. No, no, and, and as far as you know, myself and, and the caucus that I've been working with, it, it, we want to give districts as much options as, as Paula said earlier. You know what happens in Reese in the Thumb is way different than than what's happening in Southfield, and we even see those differences across ISDs. You know, so we want locals to have the ability to work with their health departments in order to come up with what's best for their district in their area. No uh, one wants to mandate anything. Paul, I believe you uh, had your hand up there. You want no, to that was say Terrence. Uh, Terrence Martin. Oh, Terrence. Oh, I sorry. did. Terrence. Oh, and, oh and both, of you, both okay. of you. All right. Paula, you first. So the, so the biggest thing when you're talking about funding is that Michigan has been woefully underfunded in its public education for the last 25 years. to a 50th in the country in increased funding amounts over the last 25 years. And we know that the um, situation with COVID adds approximately 400 extra dollars per pupil to educate while we move into a COVID-19 um, school year. So we're already underfunded. Now we're behind approximately $400 per pupil. And we want to be um, nickel and diming these school systems. Thankfully, the state legislature and the governor have worked out to fill some of those funding gaps. We're about $1.4 billion in the whole of the school aid fund because of economic turndown due to COVID-19. We know that. We're filling it up. We have to get the federal government to pass the HEROES Act. Simple. We have to get our Republican legislators, our Republican uh, members to contact Republicans outside of our state because Senator Stabenow and Senator Peters are incredible advocates for the HEROES Act. We have to get the Senate in um, the United States Senate to act on our HEROES Act funding and ensure that we get it. They're stalled right now in monies, but our students can't wait. We don't have one child to spare and we don't have one school district to spare when it comes to funding at the level that they deserve and that it takes to actually educate our children here in Michigan. Okay, and then yeah, Terrence and, Martin. And if we're going to talk about funding, we also need to talk about there were there was some cost savings that was realized by every district, and I talked about this early on, and then everyone stopped talking about it. So when you know when we're not teaching for however many months in building, there's a cost savings that real that's realized through subbing. But you know the amount that we pay for subs every week. I know in my local district, it's, it's six thousand dollars a week is their average the amount that they um, average out for their copy costs when they're budgeting. And so when you add all those little things up, including I believe every district received a rebate from their dental insurance because dental insurance, the dentist offices were closed, at least every district that I've talked to has, um, you know, there was a significant cost savings in every district. On top of the fact that there was, everyone was fully funded for last year, what, what was budgeted, they got. And there were COVID dollars that came in based on a poverty level. So a lot of districts, every district got money. And there was an additional $175 given to districts for, for this current, you know, last school year. As we move forward into the 2021 budget, you know, we have small businesses closing every day. Until we can get a handle on our economy and until we see what happens in the CREC conference on August 24th, we're not going to know a whole heck of a lot about what happens with the school budget. Okay, our so, school budgets depend on our economy to be thriving. All right, we do want to get to our viewer questions, but I know Terrence Martin had his hand up. So let's get to Terrence Martin, and then we want to get to some viewer questions. Just really quickly about, about funding, uh, and, and, and Paula sort of touched on this before. You know, the, the, the state of Michigan uh, wasn't doing so well prior to COVID. Uh, relative to properly funding its schools, and particularly schools in urban urban areas such as Detroit, where we have the largest concentration of, of, of students with specialized needs, uh, and, and those go grossly underfunded. Uh, but I will also want to clear up something that was said a little bit earlier. You know, as we as we talk about such a tough issue uh, and such a critical issue, uh, particularly for Black and Brown children uh, in the city of Detroit, uh, we've got to we've got to lead with facts. Uh, and the fact of the matter is the Detroit Federation of Teachers uh, and its, its employees were not a part 
uh, of the district's uh, draft plan. Not at all. We certainly wish we would have been, but we weren't. Uh, and so really, uh, we, we've got to be very careful and, and, and got to be truthful uh, when we talk about and share with the community, uh, because they deserve to know the truth. Uh, and we were not at the table in the beginning. Let, let me quickly let uh, a couple of more of the, other, of the other superintendents weigh in on the funding matter. Uh, Randy Leop, if I, if I was a superintendent, I would be waking up bolt upright in bed every two hours, freaking out over uh, worries about how schools were going to be funded and whether it was going to be equitable, given the new realities that we have here. Uh, is that a worry of yours right now, and how do we address it? Yeah, you know, we're still looking at a $700 per student potential shortfall for the next upcoming school year uh, if nothing changes. And so that's what school districts are facing. If you're looking at a 10,000 student school district, that's a $7 million budget problem. I would also highlight uh, last year that school districts were required to maintain all of their staff through the end of the year. And so the ability to actually save money last year was not there for school districts. Right, right. Would have been tough anyways because many of the people, transportation drivers, food service workers, they were, they were actually working to deliver meals and doing a variety of other sort of emergency types of activities in their school district. And so it wasn't that they were sitting around, um, but there really wasn't uh, uh, funds to be saved for last year. There are some additional dollars that came through CARES. They are limited in regards to how they can be spent. Yeah. And so school districts, and again, it's that issue of we just need our answer. We need answers so we can plan. And School then, districts, as we sit here today, are still looking at about a $700 per student shortfall going into the next year as they're putting all of these plans in place. Uh, Representative Hornberger was correct. They're going to receive about $175 uh, in additional uh, funding uh, for the COVID costs. But uh, uh, Paula Hebert was right also that uh, we've seen uh, estimates that are at least $400. We've seen actually a little bit higher than that. Uh, per student in regards to the cost to do um, to do uh, the uh, PPE and, and the safety uh, requirements. Uh, Representative Hornberg's right. If we were off school all year without a question and, and uh, did not have uh, students in place, potentially there would be some savings there if we were allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do that under the yeah. roadmap that we have in front of us. Yeah. But I would just highlight that uh, School districts aren't looking at that. They're assuming at some point in time, kids are going to be in, and they may be in and out. And so that's a remarkably difficult thing to plan for. That's and that's thing. why they need some stability in their budgets. And Michael DeVault, when I hear parents talk about maybe switching school districts because they think somebody else might be better uh, with their online approach, and yet halfway through the semester, they have to think about maybe switching back and going in person, and uh, now they've hitched their wagon to a district or a school that's too far away. I ha I'm at a loss as to figure out how you fund that equitably. There's, there's no question. I mean, that's why we've asked the legislature to look at funding on the, uh, I think the February 2020 count, because it, during this situation, I mean, that's one management solution to this that we have recommended. And I know that's under consideration right now, but but I'd also, I'd also like to kind of double back because I know the time's getting short. Whether we're in remote or or face-to-face or, -face or hybrid, the, my concern is, and, and, and I want to make certain that the public gets a chance to hear this, is to take care of, of the students that are having difficulty with learning on a remote model. Yeah. Also the ELL students and the special needs students. We need, we as superintendents and school boards need to make modifications so there could be some face-to-face -face time and either in small groups, because that's what I was hearing. That's what I hear from parents. That's the calls I get every day from parents. And I know our teachers support that type of instruction, but that has to happen. Otherwise we're gonna be, those students can be way more disadvantaged than they already right now. So, I mean, I think we can do everything else very, very well and handle those problems. But that's my major concern of that population, and, I, and I'd be remiss if I didn't at least uh, let your viewers hear that, yeah. that uh, request that all leaders look at that compassionately and uh, uh, teachers unions, management get together to solve that, yeah. not solve that problem, but at least address we it. We can hear that loud you know, We're clear. talking about some very important things yeah. right now. We're really doing a deep dive here. So we're probably, I can say, definitely going to run over just a little bit. Bear with us. Now, at Local 4, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Frank McGeorge, and he's an emergency room doctor at Henry Ford Hospital, leading our medical coverage of this pandemic. Uh, he has patience, and today he's been very patient, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, he's helped us really understand and navigate the science behind the spread of this virus. So, of course, we have him as part of 
this conversation tonight as well. And Dr. McGee, two really important issues uh, stand side by side in the same room. Now, we know face-to-face -face learning is optimal for a variety of reasons, but that doesn't necessarily mean it is safe to return. We have a specific question about this. So I do want to go to a viewer question first. And she says, uh, this is Carolyn from Ann Arbor, and she asks if the safety and well-being of children is our primary concern and the percentage of COVID-19 deaths of children between the ages of 5 and 14 is 0 0.13 and masks will be worn by teachers and students, why would teachers feel they can't return safely, especially when CDC guidelines report no reason why children and teachers can't return safely to school? So, Dr. McGee, what is the science behind deciding if it is safe for your particular child to return to the classroom in person? Well, all right, thanks, Paula. You know, first, I want to address that number. There's a lot of different numbers being thrown around, um, and I'm going to uh, have you roll a story in a minute about the numbers. But I think this highlights, or that question highlights a couple of important points. First of all, we are concerned about student safety, but I think it's also relevant to talk about teacher safety and safety of ancillary staff in the buildings. Um, there's a much bigger picture here that we have to think about. But going back to sort of the core issue of student students and student safety. Let me just start out by saying, you know, my mom always reminded me to never argue politics or religion. And oddly, I am finding myself saying the same thing now about the science of COVID-19. The issue is, while there are objective numbers in the data, everyone has on what those numbers mean. Sometimes even the numbers are in dispute and people quote different numbers that are not necessarily compatible with, I guess what I would consider the most reliable statistics, whether they're from the CDC, the World Health Organization, or um, really even the state. Um, so this is a charged issue, especially when it comes to the emotion of school reopening. I wanna just um, have you run the package that I had earlier about some of the numbers from two new reports. A new study published in the Archives of Disease in Children found that between January and May of this year, children, defined as being under 16, represented only 1.1% of SARS-CoV-2 positive cases in Great Britain. In the same time frame, there were eight pediatric deaths, representing a case fatality rate of 0.3%. Additionally, using historic mortality data, the authors were able to show that there were no additional deaths that might represent undetected cases of COVID-19. In the end, the authors concluded that, quote, our findings provide further evidence against the role of children in infection and transmission of SARS-CoV-2. The data from that study should be contrasted with a recent report from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Children's Hospital Association. Using data within the United States, they found as of August 6th, pediatric cases represented 9.1% of all SARS-CoV-2 cases in the U.S. Back in May, when the U.K. study ended, it was only about 3%. The reason behind the rise in the U.S. isn't proven, but experts have noted two factors. Increased testing in children, even if they're minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic, and generally increased spread in the community in both adults and children in recent months. Even with increased pediatric cases, according to the data, children represented between 0 and 0.4 percent of all COVID-19 deaths in individual states, with 19 states reporting zero child deaths. That's compatible with the CDC's data showing that compared to 18 to 29 year olds, children less than 18 have a 9 to 16 times lower risk of death. So, you know, I think it's really important to understand those numbers are what we know right now. And it's highly likely that we're going to learn more to refine our opinion over time, especially as schools reopen. But the bottom line is these facts are children do get infected, although they do not get infected as often as people over 18 and not with as severe consequences. The real question ultimately, though, is how much risk is reasonable? And I want to put a little something in perspective here because I really appreciate what all the superintendents are talking about. But I think a lot of this is from a parent standpoint, personal risk assessment for yourself, your family and really your child. So around. The decision about returning to the classroom, in my opinion, for in-person learning is highly individualized that every parent needs to think about based on a number of different factors. I'm going to lay some of my thoughts out. First off, 
What is your household risk tolerance? Is there someone at home, for example, who is a concern because of their medical history? If that is the case, then maybe your child being back in a larger exposure environment may not be as useful or as good or safe. And I would argue actually the same holds for teachers. For teachers, if you have significant medical problems, if your spouse or a family member has significant medical problems, that is a significant mitigating factor in your risk equation. So next, what are the needs of your child? And you know, some of this was touched on. Will the child learn better in person? I think universally everybody understands in-person learning is better, but everybody knows their child as well. And they know that some children will not thrive in green. That's what's wrong with have we, have we lost Frank? I believe we've lost your, <laughs> Dr. McGeorge. We will try to get him back because these were terribly important thoughts as we try and take uh, folks uh, each individual. That's what we keep saying. No matter what districts decide, no matter what teachers uh, right. or, or superintendents decide, or even what Lansing decides, parents each have to make a decision right. for what's best for their own family. Dr. Vitti, before we move on, I, did, I, I, I know you had your hand up as we were talking about the funding issue. Uh, you want to weigh in on that real quick? Yeah, I mean, not, not specifically on funding, but I think it speaks to what Frank was actually trying to say, which is we can't really talk about parents making a decision if we're not allowing for both face-to-face -face and online options. No. I, again, if, if, since we're not receiving uh, any guidance at the federal level and the state guidance has been mixed as far as consistency, if we are able to offer face-to-face -face learning, then we're going to have to problem solve regarding what that looks like. Um, so, you know, no one wants to see uh, the superintendent and, and, and the union leader um, uh, seemingly fighting on TV. You know, that's not what kids want to see. Uh, kids and parents want uh, people to work together to figure it out. Uh, when the draft plan was released in June, uh, DFT and, and uh, district administrators meet almost three times a day. Uh, so if there isn't time to talk, I don't know when there is uh, and so demands that were requested for the most part focused on not offering face-to-face -face learning until there's an immunization. We cannot, and I don't think DFT wants to do it. I don't think our teachers want to do it. We're not going to abandon 10 to 15,000 parents that need and want face-to-face -face instruction. Well, you make it a problem solve and own the challenges of COVID in order to do that. And I'm optimistic that it'll happen and we'll continue to negotiate what needs to be negotiated. Yeah. I think it's important for our Detroit parents and teachers to hear that. Uh, and you make an important point about whether if those options aren't available to parents, then uh, their decision ends up being one to perhaps leave a district. Uh, let's, uh, Dr. McGeorge, I believe we've got your, your con our connection uh, again secured with you. Uh, you were in the middle of a really important breakdown about families making their decisions. Yeah, and how to make those decisions. Oh. We have, nope, we still don't have Dr. McKee. Okay, I'm afraid we're, we're still, uh, okay, let's I'll tell you what, uh, let's, let's move on to the next group that we want to bring in to being a part of this conversation. How do teachers feel about going back to school this fall? We have three teachers with us tonight. Uh, happy to introduce to you Mark Sobolewski, a, a middle school teacher from Ann Arbor Public Schools. Uh, Lena Larson is an elementary school math teacher from Detroit Public Schools, a community school district. We should mention that she has also been uh, teaching in-person summer school. And Christopher Capuano is with us, who is a civics and history teacher from the Novi School mm. District. Teachers, so it's not just school districts and the state trying to figure out how we're going to pay for all of this. Families are obviously burdened in many ways by this pandemic. Parents in every district are faced with how to keep working while making sure their children are safe and getting an education. And so, teachers, what I want to know from you basically is, how are you helping your parents navigate this? We know you've been talking to students. You've had them in person for in-person uh, learning as well as remotely. How are you helping your parents navigate this? Mark, let's start with you. Well, uh, trying to answer as many questions as possible, uh, you know, with limited information still. Um, you know, oftentimes I think that parents, the first uh, people they feel comfortable reaching out to are the, the people they're in most contact with, which is us, the teachers. Um, unfortunately, sometimes in, in these types of situations, you know, we, um, the, the information is, is slow to get to us. Um, so uh, just 
trying to be as supportive as possible, trying to reassure them that whatever that we provide in the fall is going to be meaningful and rigorous and isn't going to be busy. Busy work. Busy, yeah. Sorry, you, you kind of dropped out there uh, for just right a at the end. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let, let me bring Elena into this. I, Elena, we watched a, a lot more drama than we usually see around summer school. Obviously, this uh, this summer, you were a part of that as you were teaching summer school. What are your thoughts now heading into the fall? Well, to try to recap the original question, to bring our parents in. Yeah. My building principal was very, very um, forward thinking about how we would start involving our next year's classes in any kinds of decisions that were made. So even though we've been off work up until the summer school time, we were dojoing, calling, texting, trying to get our parents to take the technology survey to get their devices, working with the staff up at Mumford, which is where the devices from my school were passed out, to let our parents come up on off days, the days they could get there, doing the survey with parents over the phone, helping parents do the survey um, for return to school now that they have the devices, and getting people acclimated just to the teams and how to do the things with the children. A big part of what we did in summer school too was the children that were in there were not always able to participate in the distance learning. So we also worked on getting them to learn teams, but just trying to be there and listen to what the parents are saying. Cause it wasn't so much the students we were able to engage with on a daily basis that I was concerned about um, we were doing our, you know, calling families and making sure that everything was all right, trying to call people once a week, check in, find out how things were. Yeah. And just hearing what the parents were saying about what they needed and what their frustrations were and how, you know, things were not going ideally for them. And I know that Dr. Vitti and uh, Connected Futures has worked really hard to get us technology, but I'm still not sure we're going to be able to reach a significant amount more of students if they don't have someone in the home to help them. That's huge, and that really brings us to our next viewer question, because Cena in Redford asks this question, and we know many parents are grappling with this for themselves. And this is what she says. She says, who is going to teach my son all day while my husband and I work? We're both essential workers. I'm a nurse, and he is in retail. Our child care provider is my 74-year-old mother who doesn't have the internet or the patience or the know-how to be my son's third grade teacher. And so how would you answer that question? Let's go to Christopher Capuano about that one. Are you specifically addressing me or do you just uh, want a teacher? Oh yeah, we to wanted to hear from the teachers, but we haven't heard from Christopher yet. Okay. I, I would have to say that that's a great question. I mean, that is one of the things that a lot of people are grappling with. We're trying as much as we can to help and support people who are in difficult situations, but at the same time, we're limited for what we can provide. Um, we, as teachers, we want to get out there and we want to teach. Technology is a tool to do that, but it's also something that we're learning to do as we move through it. And it's, it is a very difficult situation, especially when you have parents that have responsibilities that, are, that don't allow them to help yeah. their children at the time that they need it. Uh, all three of our teachers, I want to ask you all, where do you want to be? Where do you feel, and I, I, may, I know you all want to be in the classroom, but right now with all that you know, where do you feel is best for you to be moving into the new school year? Mark, you first. Home. Uh, absolutely, I think we should be starting virtually. Um, and that pains me to say, I didn't uh, become a teacher to teach virtually. Um, but as a social studies teacher, you know, I just keep thinking, uh, is it really up to the public to determine when we go back to school? Um, <laughs> when people, when I stop seeing news stories about large events happening in Michigan and 4th of July parties and all of these, um, push all of the pushback to all of the medical advice we're getting, um, I, I think it's the public's responsibility to put us back in our classrooms. We are in the middle of quite a social studies project. That's no doubt about that. Elena, where do you think you should be in the new school year? I'm so afraid to go back, but my heart is with the parents and the parents that don't have the choice to um, work inside the home or the parents that don't have the choice or the means or the access to get a pod or private tutoring 
So I don't know if it's because I worked within the archdiocese for a significant amount of my teaching career, but this is my calling. And I feel like it's my duty to go back to work. At the same time, I fully um, support any teacher, such as Mark, I'm not sure how um, Christopher feels, who feels it's not safe to go back to the classroom. I wish more districts could give the option that our district is large enough to give. I'm still very concerned because I'm not hearing voices of teachers in the special ed and all the various specials. We're just three voices from so many teachers that all have fears and sure. children that may not be in the same district as them or children that may not have the supervision they need. Well, the child is home for online schooling because that district is not online, but the parent teacher still must either teach face to face or teach digitally from a building. So there's just so many considerations, but I respect everyone's decision. I know that um, I'm not even gonna lie. I've, been told some things, but I'm okay with it. I've never waited for anyone to ask me what my opinion is, and I've never apologized for what I've said. <laughs> so I just, I'm with the parents. Well, let me let Christopher weigh in then. How are you feeling? Where do you want to be? As a teacher, I want to be in the classroom. I got in, I got into it because of the students, and that's why we all want to be there and what we all want to do. However, depending on when you ask me and what I've just previously read, it sways my opinion because <laughs> we're constantly inundated with so wow. much information. One day it sounds great, and the next I'm reading stuff where in Georgia they're they're quarantining 1,200 students. It's it's a difficult situation, and we want to do what we want, we can for the students, but at the same time we want to make sure they're safe and we're safe because, as stated, we have ancillary people around us that have issues. So it is not it's it's not a cut and dry situation where you can say I want this. Yeah. As teachers, we tend to roll with what happens. I just want to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, good segue to get back to Dr. McGee because I think we've worked out all of your bugs. So, Dr. You got McGee, me? Yeah, I think so. You hear me? Yeah. You. But but this is so important, and we do want to get to some more viewer questions. So stay with us, if you would. We know we're running a little bit long, but this is a big conversation. Mm. This is a big topic. But you were in the middle of explaining how parents can decide and for teachers. themselves and <laughs> teachers yeah. for themselves. Thank you. When it is safe and how they can determine if it is safe to do face-to-face -face or in-person. Yeah, so, you know, again, just to, I, and I apologize for missing part of the conversation if I'm repeating some things, but, you know, first off, you have to ask what your household risk tolerance is. Basically, what do you have going on at home that would make it safe or unsafe for you to return to in-person learning, whether that's as a student, parent, uh, or uh Or, you know, or ancillary staff in a school. What are the needs of your child? Different children learn differently in different environments. Special services are available that are best done in person, especially special needs classes. Perhaps that's where a child gets nutrition. Um, in some cases, it's a real world consideration. Parents simply need to know that their child will be cared for because they cannot care for them because they are otherwise working. Um, but then even bigger picture, you have to ask whether the school is ready. What are the policies and the procedures for risk mitigation, whether that's masks, cleaning, distancing, symptom screening, response to positive cases? Are you as the parent or the teacher comfortable with what the school is doing? And that speaks to what I I think a lot of the superintendents have addressed. But finally, there is the really big picture. What do the numbers look like in your school, in your city, in the county, and in the state? Because those not only change your personal risk calculus, they a community public health response and change everything. I mean, if all of a sudden our case positivity counts go above five or 10%, 5% really, that would suggest widespread community transmission. And at that point, it's no one's decision. It's the governor's decision whether or not we go back to a stay at home order. Um, I think everyone needs to acknowledge here that the risk is never going to be zero. And everyone's tolerance for risk is going to be a little bit different. And I think because every family has different needs and different risk tolerance, schools should be and are doing whatever they can to accommodate both in-person and remote options if possible knowing that in-person education is really the best choice and I think the most ideal goal. 
Uh, Doc, I want to uh, quickly uh, follow up. Uh, you mentioned uh, the cases. I, I, you and I and everybody at Local 4 promised ourselves very early on we were never going to get either too rattled or too delighted by any single day's data. However, Today's new reports on cases took us back over a thousand cases. We jumped quite a bit over the last 24 hours. I, I, I know we wouldn't want, I don't want to make, nobody's going to be expected to make decisions on one set of 24 hour uh, cases, but what are your concerns as you looked at the newest report today? Well, you know, it's not just the newest report from today, actually. If you look at the curve, you know, so the state of Michigan logs new cases by the date of onset of symptoms. So, in fact, we report on the news a new number of cases every day. But you actually have to look at the MyStart graphs to figure out what, what date those new cases are actually placed on, because they're not distributed only on the day that we report them. They're yeah. actually distributed for, in some cases, a week or two before, because that might have been when the symptom onset was. The point being, I've been watching the symptom onset graph over the last month um, and it has been steadily building and so um, you know today's high number is just going to add to those last several counts and ultimately what what we need to focus on is not only the daily case count but really whether or not there's evidence of ongoing community transmission and honestly schools are a huge priority but you know ultimately this is going to have bigger ripple effects whether it's you know casinos restaurants um, you name the you know the, sure. the business sure. um, we're going to have to reel things back if those numbers begin to go back up. And frankly, I think, you know, the, the making the case that taking proper precautions, whether it's distancing, mask use, whatever, um, would help everything is absolutely accurate. If we as a society do not do our part in individually and as a society to re reduce transmission, we are going to continue on a very un- Frankly, if you look at the curve of daily new cases and the, the general trend, it's actually going upward and there's a slight downward trajectory. That downward trajectory should not fool anyone because if there are new cases that occur over here and they get redistributed to that downward area, all of a sudden in a couple of days, that downward area is going to go right back up. Yeah. So. This is a much bigger thing than just looking at daily case counts. And I'm sure that there are epidemiologists in Lansing. I know, you know, the the director of um, the the medical director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She's looking at these numbers on a daily basis and everybody is trying to make a decision about when we need to pull the trigger on rolling things back if it's necessary. This is going to be a decision not only at a state level, but at a regional level. And that's why I encourage every parent to stay active and pay attention to the numbers again. Yeah. All right, now, Doc, it, we're, starting, we're starting to struggle with Not only in their bit. city, not only in their county, but in the whole, because that's really what matters, is the bigger picture and then dra drawing down into a smaller area. It might turn out that there's a hot spot in a specific county that might be accounting for a lot of cases, but there might be another area of the county that's just fine. And I want to make another point. There are some counties that are perhaps hot areas, and we always say that counties, you know, people don't don't live at a county line. So if a if and I'm just arbitrarily saying going to say Macomb County, if numbers in Macomb County go up, that doesn't mean that those are only Macomb County people. Residents in Oakland County go to Macomb County; they share. But schools and childrens generally really represent specific geographies. And that is a uh, more controllable thing than patterns of traffic for um, employment and for recreation. So yeah. that those are other considerations that I think need to go into the mix. And that Good, yeah, got to get to some other questions. We need to move that along. <laughs> that is Great why we have, yes, yeah, so many questions, yeah. concerns, and emotions when it comes to return to school. So we decided to take a poll and talk to our WDIV insiders about how they're feeling. We polled 100 of them, and here's a look at the results. First question, do you think kids should return to in-person school classes this fall? 68% no. 32% said yes. Next, how long should virtual only exist? 
Only the first semester wins with 34%. 30% want to wait until there's a working vaccine. 22% say the entire fall semester. Yeah, now this one was really interesting because when asked how confident are you that school districts will make the right decision about returning to in-person classes and when to do so, take a look at this. 39% were unconfident with 24% saying they were very unconfident. <laughs> However, 28% say they are confident with the decisions and hopefully by listening to our superintendents this evening, they might get a little more confident understanding that there is a lot of thought going into this. This yeah. is not this is what's keeping these educators up at night. So there is a lot of thought. The science is changing. It's a it's a novel coronavirus. It's new. We They're learning. And so they have to learn as well. We keep forgetting the word novel as part of it. We're learning it every day. Uh, by the novel, way, novel, not the, the good in, novel, not the good kind. Uh, if you want to see the entire poll, and also we would uh, suggest you become a WDIB <laughs> insider, you can check that out on our homepage. So challenging time for parents now. Let's move to that part of this. Each family, as we've mentioned, making their own choices for their own different sets of reasons. We've got two parents with us now tonight. Keisha Barber has a ninth grader and a seventh grader. And Nikki Little has twin boys going into the second grade. Thank you both so much uh, for being with us tonight as we uh, keep, uh, it's a game of Tetris. We keep fitting all the boxes in. Uh, Keisha, I want to start with you because you're making a split choice. You're keeping your daughter at home to learn, but you're sending your son to school in person. Talk about the, the difference in the decisions that you've made and why they were right for you. Well, um, it was a very, very hard decision, um, but my son is entering the ninth grade. Um, he's changing schools. He's entering DPS schools. Um, it's a brand new school system for him. And the school that we chose, um, it has a very, very small classroom size. I've been in contact with the dean and the principals, and they won't have any more than seven students in the classroom, they have assured me. And if it becomes to be more, then they will, you know, uh, alert me and let me know as soon as possible. Mm. And I can change and at any time and bring him home for remote learning. My daughter has been at the same school since kindergarten. She's very familiar with her teachers. Um, she was very um, involved with the learning uh, online when they ended school abruptly. So she's very comfortable with that. So my son, because he's going into a new environment um, as Concerned as I am, I'm, I'm going to send him into the building. He knows how to um, take all necessary precautions. And at any point, if he feels uncomfortable, then we'll, we'll, we'll change it and bring him home. Well, but it sounds to me, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds to me that rather than saying you're confident and comfortable with the way this is going, you're sweating bullets over it. Yeah, you can hear the I am sweating. I, I don't think that either situation is e easy for me. Having them home is going to be hard because I'm a single mom. Yep. Um, mm. And, you know, with my daughter being at home, it, neither neither situation is comfortable mm. being at home or sending him in the building. I'm I'm not I'm not comfortable with either decision, but I'm, I'm doing what I think is the best right now. Wow. You got so tough, tough decisions yeah. for these parents. So, Nikki, you say uh, that your sons will be learning virtually, but you're making plans so that they can work with other classmates, right? So is this one of these pods that we're hearing about? Yes, yes, it is. So we have decided to partner with two other families in our neighborhood who are approaching social distancing and safety guidelines the same way that our family is. So we, before we heard from our school district what the plan was, my husband and I, we've been working from home since mid-March. And so we were in the same situation as many other parents where we were teaching our kids at the end of last year and trying to figure out how to work from home and make it all work. So it was difficult and we made it through, but um, in waiting for our school district to make the decision, we were very heavily leaning toward virtual anyway. Mm -hmm. And our school district, we are in Berkeley, they did decide to go all virtual. So we immediately started talking with a few other families in the neighborhood and figuring out how could we find a few others that we trust who would agree to have open communication with us throughout this entire process. But we could still have that socialization and that small group learning that we know is so crucial for kids at a young age. And Nikki, you're from Berkeley. Describe for me then what your experience was for those last three months of the school year with trying to do it at home. How'd it go? It was a roller coaster. Um, some days went well, other days were very challenging. Um, it's, it's not ideal to work from home and try to teach our, our children, but we, we made it work and we took it one day at a time. And we're very fortunate that our 
teachers and our school, our principal and our superintendent, our district have been so, so openly communicative and very, very supportive. And they've been doing the best that they could do. And, um, you know, like the superintendents here were saying, and Dr. Franklin George was saying, it's a very personalized decision and we yep. have to weigh the different risks and assess what is best for each family. So what our family is doing may not work for other families, but this is what we've decided and we and we feel is best. So we're gonna try it and, and do whatever we can to make it work. Yeah, you know, this is so representative of what's going on throughout yes. our community with these, just these two moms running the gamut, trying to figure out how to educate, how right. to best educate right. their children. Okay, so we've got another viewer question and it focuses on what happens if school has COVID-19 cases. So real concern for parents. Denise from South Lyon actually asks this and she says, I've looked at my district's plan as well as a couple of neighboring district plans and they all say if a COVID case is detected, they will follow local health department recommendations. But what are those scenarios? Uh, what will the health department recommend? My biggest concern, she continues, for going back in person is not the disease itself, but the inconsistency of jumping back and forth from in person to remote. And I need to know what situations will require a move to remote anytime a person in the school is diagnosed or just a specific class. So not sure how that would work in secondary, but... Uh, have that is a big question. It, it, it's, it's massive. And, and even though it, this one is specifically to Oakland County, uh, all of you uh, as superintendents are having to worry about that. I, I believe we've still got Randy with us, right? Uh, Randy Leopold is there from. Yes. Uh, what's going to happen if all of a sudden we get some cases in a school? What do you do? Well, the health department uh, in Wayne County has laid out a pretty clear plan in regards to what will happen. And, you know, if you look at what's happened down south already in some of the school districts that have opened up, it's a, a very similar process from, from the health departments across the country. And that is, first of all, you're going to quarantine. Secondly, you're going to contact Trace, and then you're going to get quarantine those people. So that's why you see the numbers going up so quickly and why there's anxiety among school districts that they're going to be in this rolling start and stop because just a handful of cases in a school could lead you to several hundred students and staff that have to be quarantined and all of a sudden school has to shut down. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. VT does not have to guess at this because this actually happened with in-person right. summer school. They had three cases and that was a small percentage. Mm -hmm. When you think about what was going on in Detroit and it ran about the percentages in Detroit. So Dr. VT, uh, the question to you is what happened when you found out that those students did indeed test positive for COVID? Did you quarantine the entire classroom and what happens to students who may have come in contact? Yeah, um, uh, so just to build off of what Randy um, uh, had stated, I think it's important to note that the images and photos that we saw um, from places like Georgia regarding the opening were examples of reopening that were completely inappropriate, um, irresponsible, and did not follow a lot of the guidelines that were put out by the CDC. You can't open up a school with 100% of kids back without masks, you know, traveling in hallways without staggered schedules. Yep. That, that is a recipe for mayhem. If any school district in Michigan is thinking about opening up schools like that, then it's contradictory to the best practice that we know regarding COVID safety. Um, uh, so in the summer, we did uh, have to test because of a court order. The three students that tested positive were in three separate schools. Um, and after they tested after two weeks of uh, summer school. So we did not see a spread of COVID uh, due to face-to-face -face summer school with them being in three separate areas. All three were asymptomatic and were not sick. But to answer your question directly, um, because uh, we had small class sizes, which we would in the fall if we opened up face-to-face, -face, you, can, you can identify what students were in close contact with each other and what teacher was involved. And then those individuals all go to a self-quarantine for 14 to 10 days. So it would be the students uh, and any employees. And then we would shift to online learning and then after that point, the parent uh, would have a decision to come back to face-to-face -to -face or continue online. Uh, you see, we've got a couple of students that have uh, jumped in. We're going to get to them in just a second. I want to let the other two superintendents talk about this very important matter, though, first. That was an, an Oakland parent uh, that sent that question in. So, uh, Dr. Cook Robinson, why don't you tell us what would happen in your situation? Yeah, absolutely. What we have done, we are partnering with the Oakland County Health Department. We are going to assign a nurse to every single district in Oakland County, depending on the size and the demographics and the 
um, facilities in the district, which is what we use to assign. Districts will have anywhere from one to three nurses. So we will have a nurse that will be monitoring the, hmm. the environment and will be actually monitoring this process. And it's exactly as Randy said, you know, we will follow those steps, but we will have a nurse monitoring that. In addition, we have set up a meeting with the executive deputy that the health department reports to. He and his staff will be on a phone call with all 28 local superintendents every single week. The one thing that we have to remember as superintendents make these difficult decisions, this is first and foremost a health crisis. Therefore, we need the health department helping to make these decisions and to monitor. Mm -hmm. For our superintendents, their number one issue is safety, the safety of staff and the safety of students. Yep. There is no way we can provide a no-risk environment, but we're trying to reduce that risk to the lowest possible risk that we have. Yeah, it's interesting because generally it would be education first, but I think now it's yeah. safety and then education. Mike DeVault, do you have Absolutely. anything to add to that? Well, I, I just add that uh, our safety requirements are posted on our website at misd.net, and, and, and we've included them in every single plan that has been submitted to the, uh, to the that, that is due this Friday. Each superintendent's got them posted on the website, and it outlines specifically what would happen in each case, so a mom or dad can look at it in advance and know what would happen, and, and every teacher would know what would happen. So, I mean, I'm pretty confident that... Uh, 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 this situation, I mean, I mean, there's predictability under under all those circumstances. Yeah. Well, so we've heard a lot from superintendents now mm -hmm. and teachers and parents. What do the students think? Very happy to have a group of them with us now. And joining us, Olivia Slazinski, an incoming freshman at Michigan State University. How's that for your uh, freshman year <laughs> off at the wow. school you've been dreaming about for so long? Uh, Jackson Douglas is a sophomore at U of D Jesuit mm -hmm. High. And Kasaya Davis is a senior at Cass Tech High School. So I want to get to all of you with uh, what your thoughts are as we get closer and closer to the school year. I really do uh, feel for the, the, the college students who put so much of that thought into going away to school and having that, that experience, that whole experience yeah. of it. And this is kind of so uh, dystopic. Uh, so, Olivia, let me start with you. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I am still going to school in the fall, mm -hmm. and they gave us a choice of like staying home or. Um, living on campus. And right now all of my classes will be online, which is really difficult to hear just because I'm going into a completely new atmosphere and I am going to have a difficult time adjusting just because I'm gonna have less relationships with my professors, with my classmates, um, which will be really hard just like going into a completely new academic and um, like educational atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like kind of thrown this um, curveball where everything will have to be virtual with new tools, <clears throat> new resources. Not the way you dream it up, no doubt about it. Uh, Jackson, uh, talk to me about your, your thoughts about uh, going back to school at uh, U of D Jesuit. Uh, I'm actually going in as a freshman. Oh, freshman, sorry. What a way but, to start uh, high school. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. But I'm going back in a hybrid mode hmm. as our school made it, which means I go in some days and I stay home some days, which means I get the safety of staying home and protected while also being able to get the in-class experience. And with my school, we have in the academy, you kind of get the high school experience, exper experience, being able to g exchange between classes like a high school would and being able to have some of the same teachers that I would, would have had in the academy. Hmm. If that was, if it was completely up to you, is this how you would do it—a sort of a half and half hybrid system, or would you rather do it one way or, or the other? I personally adapted to the remote style and feel like I still have some room to grow, but could definitely work with it. Hmm. And just having that little bit of teacher interaction could help me a lot. We haven't talked near as much about the kids for whom that was a better situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, kids We've who got maybe, one other student, though. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. Yes, I know. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> let's, 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 let's. Yeah, we want to hear from our other student. To, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Kasai. Well, hello. Um, so far, um, Cass, we haven't decided, or I haven't heard of if we're going to do it in person or virtual. I personally would just like virtual because mm. it will be easier and it's less risky for me. And 
once this first started happening back in March, I did adapt to the online learning and got used to that. And I feel like it would be safer. Yeah. And, and Devin, you're absolutely right, because listening to these students is so important because that's who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, so I, I'm just curious to, I'm curious to know, and I'll, if we have a little bit of time, then I do want to know if you have any questions for your superintendents. But I do want to get to one more viewer question, because this is a question we've received from several people. And Russell in Plymouth says, uh, or rather asks, what about an educational gap? Now, this is something we hear about for college kids. Yeah, sure. gap year. But now we're talking about schools. And so what Russell continues to say is, uh, why would it work? Why wouldn't it? And Chris in Macomb Township says, can you just skip this year and return to school in fall of 2021? Why aren't the school districts giving the option of a gap year? And this one boggles the mind, because keep in mind, we're not just competing on a state level. We have yeah. to compete on a global level. And people in other countries are actually going back to school. Olivia, did you think about taking a gap year? Um, honestly, no, I didn't think of that because personally for me, I can adjust to online and in-person learning, um, like regardless of my preference, but, um, I didn't feel like a gap year would be for me specifically to be like falling behind a year and having to give up my, um, like a whole year of schooling, um, it would have been like uncomfortable for me to not be moving on with my college experience. Sure. sure. I don't want to, I, I guess I'll be the one who sounds like the grumpy old man who wants the kids off his lawn. Uh, Kasaya, I'm curious, do you think your friends have a grasp of uh, the seriousness of this virus? Uh, uh, do, uh, how, how seriously do you think that your friends generally uh, think of this as, as a risk in their lives? So with everything happening, I realize we are the most hard-headed generation. Um, <laughs> not a lot of people take it serious. You know, I'll make sure we go in the store. I'm like, you have your mask or I have extra masks in the car. So just knowing that my peers, it depends. It depends on, you know, how they actually look at it or what they've been through. I know a lot of people who didn't take it serious at first, but it affected their family and they really opened their eyes to see that this is really a serious thing. Jackson, same question for you. Uh, my friends, we don't really... We don't really like to talk about like the serious things that are happening in the world, but we still take it seriously. Like we still wear our masks when we're out in public. Okay. So we just like to just not think about it really. Yeah, and that's really gonna be a key for the older students that they are taking mm -hmm. it seriously. And a lot of that really does depend on what's going on in the household. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, 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 I want to see who, who all we've got still here on the call, because before we go, I did, uh, I, a lot of you have been waiting patiently without having said much over the last uh, uh, 45 minutes or so, or even up to an hour, and you've heard a lot. And so, uh, Terrence, uh, it, it, what would you like to add here before we say so long, and we'll try and get a, a few other final thoughts here. Well, I just want just want to add that um, you know it, it, it was said a bit earlier. You know, look, this is this is less about teaching and learning and more about health and safety. Uh, and when I think about my members uh, who sacrificed so much uh, back in March and, and picked up uh, and adjusted and did extremely well uh, with the online platform and without having very much uh, time to prepare at all, uh, they did an extraordinary job and, and really looked at you know, how they can positively affect children uh, with, with, with uh calling home and, and making sure that they were safe and checking on family members. Uh, they did an extraordinary job, and I don't think enough has been said about that, um, but, but it, it was just outstanding to see um, um, how much uh, our students really, our teachers really love our students yeah. and were able to sacrifice for them. But also, also just very cautious uh, about really how this has affected Detroit and black and brown communities at a disproportionate rate. Uh, and we really, really look at, you know, if it's safe to, to return to school or, or should we uh, be online, we really have to look at what the impact has been to our community here in Detroit. Uh, we have students um, that we teach uh, that have lost loved ones uh, and weren't able to mourn them in the way that we traditionally mourn our loved ones. And so we really look at this. This is going to be an issue relative to our students' mental health. Uh, the, the, them experiencing uh, a high level of trauma uh, above and beyond uh, what we've seen with uh, the, the recent uh, and ongoing uh, issues with police brutality. All of this plays a part in, in how we're going to safely 
uh, uh, educate our children and to keep them healthy uh, throughout this experience. This is tough for everyone uh, on all sides of, of the issue, uh, but at the core, uh, really is the health and safety and the health and safety of our students. And, and, and uh, that takes me back to the point that Paula Herbart uh, with the MEA made early on. Paula, I, I, I take it to heart. We, he's, Terrence is right. We, we, when we see how intense it's been felt in places like Detroit and a number of other communities across Michigan, but if I'm a teacher in East Tawas, um, it, it's difficult to maybe connect to that passionately. And uh, so I, I'm curious as what your thoughts are given everything that you've heard now over the last hour and a half. Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that I would say is I think that the pandemic shown a very bright light on the importance of our community public school system, the work that educators do across the board, certificated staff and ESP. We are a constant for many, many children in their lives. And we take that seriously. At the MEA, we talk about the profound trust put in educators to ensure not only that they get a quality education, but they feel safe and they feel secure as human beings. Yeah. And so regardless of whether we're face-to-face, -face, hybrid, part-time uh, remote learning, part-time face-to-face, or all um, uh, remote learning, we take that very seriously. Educators will remote They'll remediate, they'll look, they'll assess, they'll ensure, they'll find out where the learning gaps were and where they might be. They'll continue to do the good work. But if one lesson has been learned from all of this, Devin and Paula, it is that public schools make a huge difference in the community. And we know how important it is for students to have those connections with those um, public schools and everything that they provide for their students. Yeah, we are so reminded of the way we circulate around our education system. Paula and Terrence, thank you both so much. You guys have been very patient. We'll let you guys go. Uh, but thanks so much for being part of our conversations tonight. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's get back to some more questions that we've got from viewers. Uh, Barb from Warren wanted to know this. If the governor's order does not allow gatherings more than 10 people, how is it safe for children to be in school? Are they going to limit each classroom to nine students and one teacher? Probably not, I'm assuming. Uh, Dr. Viti, you want to take a crack at that one? I, I always get the hard questions. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm the only one willing to answer that. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we've actually been asking that question ourselves. Um, you know, as we review the reopening plan, but uh, we've we've uh, contacted the governor's office about that. Uh, and frankly, this is one of those examples of contradiction uh, mm -hmm. around uh, many, many executive orders that have been released uh, that are often contradictory. Uh, but the guidance that we have received is that um, that 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 executive order decision did not apply to schools. Um, now, I, I can't interpret that. I can't <laughs> explain that. Uh, you would have to talk directly to the governor or her office or uh, Dr. Caldoun, but that's the guidance that we've been given. And again, and I'll, I'll continue to repeat, I think it's said, it said multiple times, DPSCD is not going to make an, uh, a decision about face-to-face -face instruction or allowing that to happen in isolation. Uh, we trust the governor. Uh, we trust her health experts. And if the state health department uh, through the governor says that face-to-face -face is not safe, then we will not allow face-to-face -to, -face to happen. Yeah. But I think it's important if the state says it's safe, then I, I do believe it's important for DPSED and then frankly all districts to offer a face-to-face -face option. You know, I think no matter how you cut it, when you think about face-to-face -face learning and why it's so very important, then you think about the special needs students who really benefit greatly from in-person instruction, really hands-on. Um, Lynn from Livonia asks, what about students with special needs? Online learning is an option for them, but none of the, of, of the districts rather seem to be addressing their needs. They have been forgotten. My son is autistic and he is not receiving any of the services he is entitled to based on his IEP. What can be done for students like my son? IEP, by the way, uh, is the individual education plan that every special needs student is entitled to for in-person learning under the law. But remember, mm -hmm. th here, here's the caveat, in-person learning under the law. That's very, very important. And I just think that's really a great question. 
Um, before we get to some of the answers, I do want to take a little, just a little closer look at what families are dealing with right now. As complicated as back to school is for any parent and any student in almost any school district, compound that difficulty when you are a parent of a special needs student. Here is Sam. Sam has autism. And while he has good self-help skills, he does require extra help in a school setting. He has an aide who goes with him and he has an aide who stays with him during lunch. It's a very small class, which is great. and. He does really great. He loves to pretend to do lawn work. But for Sam, there is no navigating new normals and routine changes. For him, every day is a labyrinth of various sensory and emotional hurdles to jump. Now throw things in like masks and hand sanitizer, and the day becomes almost intolerable. I think it's the feel of something weird on his hands. The face mask, we got him to wear it, like I said, bribing him. For me, it's bribe um for about a half an hour his mother jennifer says her district allen park has not yet provided her with enough information to plan for sam i've asked a lot of questions to a lot of people um i feel like i have and it has not been addressed he is in um the allen park uh public schools autistic program so he goes to when he goes to school he goes in the autistic room my concern is that they haven't addressed how they're going to deal with him. Jennifer actually sees the back to school equation through three different goggles. A parent of a special needs child, a parent of a non special ed child, and a teacher in a different district. Now, this spring, it was a juggling act for her to teach her students remotely and handle her own children. It was a very difficult situation dividing my time between what they needed, what my students needed, and it was a lot of juggling. I would like some guidance. I would like some help. And it doesn't seem like that is willingly being provided because this is such an unprecedented situation, which I do understand, but I need help. You know, this, this is really tough. This one breaks my heart mm -hmm. because when you think about students, particularly those who are lower functioning and they actually have a pair pro who goes with them from place right. to place, right. they need an assistance, assistant rather, they need that hands on uh, contact with a teacher in order for them to reach their goals. Okay, so we know this is an everybody problem. When it's one child, it's everybody's problem. Uh, I don't want to pick on Allen Park. However, Allen Park is in Wayne County, and so Dr. Leopa, <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to come straight to you. How do you address this? I know we've talked about this in some of our forums with you, but how do you address these parents? Because there is absolutely no way you can send a parapro into their homes. How are these students going to reach their goals? Well, I'll start by saying what was described by the parents is the real life uh, issues that are happening uh, in families uh, across uh, the state of Michigan and in the mm -hmm. country, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, I can assure you that special education teachers, principals, and superintendents have this on their radar in regards to a significant issue. We know very clearly that our most vulnerable students are the ones that suffer the most in this type of environment. And so I think you will see different things next year compared mm -hmm. to what we saw in the spring when we were in crisis mode. Even if school districts are online, I have heard school districts talk, number one, about bringing in their high need students, their special education students, because they can social distance potentially in the building. While maybe they can't with every student, they can do it with their most needy students. And so I know that's being considered in several school districts. I can't speak to every single one, how they're handling it. The other thing that I would highlight is that when we look at uh, the support for families and kids through this whole process, the IEP process that's out there uh, that school districts have to adhere to, there's this thing called compensatory education that we're also talking about. And that is we recognize that our special education students actually have lost over this period of time. And we're now trying to figure out what does compensatory ed look like for students so they can actually get above and beyond what they would get when we're actually able to get school up and going again. So I know those are two specific things that school districts are talking about, uh, but it is a remarkable challenge uh, for our school districts. There is, uh, in some cases, almost uh, uh, an impossible situation in regards to expect the online learning 
And we, uh, we feel not just for the students, but for the parents who have a remarkable challenge in regards to supporting their students that have special needs. Yeah, we know that Rome wasn't built in a day and you can't rebuild an yeah. entire school curriculum in three months, particularly when you didn't see it coming or even five months yeah. when you really didn't see it coming. But, but uh, Dr. Leopold, I do want to ask you this because you're saying that you're looking at these things, but what's the possibility of you even being able to get any of this in gear for special needs students even by October? I think absolutely school districts are looking at the options that I discussed for the start of the school year, not for the middle of the school year or down the road. So when I mean looking into it, they're trying to figure out the best way to do it. But those are the things that school districts are talking about for the start of school. Yeah, let uh, us know first. When you, do, when you do get that that piece, do let us know first, please. And sure. one of our teachers, uh, I believe Elena Larson, wasn't it you that was talking earlier about uh, your worries about special, uh, special needs students and teachers? This was exactly what you were talking about, right? Yes, it was. There was a conversation I've had with several people, both in my family, who also either have special needs children, and we also have, um, I have two sisters that also teach. So um, it, it feels like it's the elephant in the room that we all know is there, but no one wants to acknowledge because, you know, for some families, it's very easy to go online. And it makes a lot of sense, but I'm thinking about children that are severely, um, have severe medical impairments. They um, have tracheotomies, they are in wheelchairs, they are yeah. homebound learners. Yeah. How yeah. are we going to adjust this for them to be able to learn safely yeah. too? And, it, you know, what, what we're talking about, you know, some districts, they're doing all online or virtual, but they're asking the special needs teachers to provide face to face. I mean, what additional measures can they give those Great teachers question. for safety? Yeah. Because, well, I feel like I do have a choice in my district because we do have, you know, a very large district and a superintendent that is allowing the teachers to have some say in what our placement might be next year. It doesn't seem like a special needs teacher in that district, especially the parent that was speaking on the segment, has that choice. Yeah. Because even though her colleagues might moment. be learning online yeah. and teaching online, she has to go into a building and she's also concerned about her student, her child. You know, I hate to say it's there, there are just no easy answers on this, but I do feel like, this I think this true. was kind of like a good date because nobody got a text <laughs> message and nobody left. So we lasted true. a little bit longer. I do want to thank but, our superintendent. Let me, let me get one, yeah. uh, if we could, just lastly before, as we were saying goodbye here, um, uh, Pam Hornberger, you've heard a lot tonight. Uh, as you head back to Lansing now, chairing the education committee, uh, is there anything you wanted to add before we go? Oh, it's pretty complicated. Yes. I'm just hoping that we can get to a point where um, our, our local superintendents feel empowered to make um, good choices for their families and for their students, um, and that we can get everyone, you know, back to school, whether it's face to face or virtual or a hybrid, whatever works best for your district, and that we're doing it, you know, in relation to your local health departments and following those safety measures, because I, honestly, I think they're the people that are going to give us the best answers as far as health and safety, yeah, yeah. you know, in our schools. And Dr. VT, as the uh, head of the largest district in the state, why don't you put a bow on it for us tonight? Anything you'd like to leave us with? You know, um, I, I would just say at the, the height of the pandemic, um, when when everyone's fear was the greatest, um, when the when the rates were out of control, when all of us, I think, in our own spaces, our own families, uh, were dealing with um, loved ones who were sick, loved ones who died, um, a lot of our parents that are in our districts served us. Uh, those were the parents that shelved the, the 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 grocery stores, the nurses that served us when we were sick. Um, very good. And, you know, I, I, I deeply believe that traditional public education is about serving our parents and our communities. And there is legitimate fear and concern about returning. And we cannot return as if we were coming back. We can't look, uh, in schools can't look like they did before the pandemic. Yeah. But, no, they won't. but today is different than yesterday. We know more about COVID um, and with the right investment, I think we have a moral obligation to work with our teachers, to work with our parents and our community to serve parents and students where they are now. They were there in their own way when we needed them. And I think as educators, we need to be there for them now. And it's our turn as far as being civically minded, 
civically responsible and having reciprocity with our community. That's who we are as traditional public educators. And I think we have to figure that out in a collaborative way. We can't start with no, we can't end with no. So how do we figure this out and own collectively this challenge? Because it's not going away. And as we talk about the suffering in the past, we don't want to we don't want to contribute to the suffering in the future if by leaving parents dry. I'm fond of quoting our second president, John Adams, who said there are two kinds of people in the world, those with a commitment and those who require the commitment of others. We have been joined tonight by many, many people with a commitment. I'm so grateful for all of you being with us tonight. We admire all of you and what you're trying to do, including the students. Thank you all so much for being here and best of luck in the new school year. Thanks for hanging out with us. We yeah. really appreciate it. This was fun. Let's yeah. do this again sometime. <laughs> yep. You got it. Folks, good luck. We know the school year is getting ready to start. This won't be our only town hall. Thanks for sticking it out with us. We appreciate you. And thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Education for All Town Hall here on Local 4 as we are committed to helping parents, teachers, students, and the superintendents get through this transition into a new school year and what it's going to mean for years ahead. Absolutely. And Devin, great to see you, even yeah, if I know. it's We've from a distance. Part. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. Of course, we have lots of reports on Local 4 and right here on clickondetroit.com. Thank you so much for staying with us. Be safe. Remain well. Good night. Thank you.